Good morning. I'm Maria Elena Bevilacqua, Senior Class President for the Class of 2020. Here with me today are SGA Co-Chairs Caroline Mabinski and Christian Ralbudo and Senior Commencement Chair Sarah Dilberian. It is our great pleasure to welcome all of you, classmates, families, and friends, to the 2020 United Convocation. Today's event is not only an important institutional moment for Holy Cross, but this is one more experience, even if virtual, for our class to share together. This is a unique moment for us to reminisce, to acknowledge all that we've been through together, to consider all that we've accomplished in this past year since departing the hill, and to look forward to where we're currently headed. The college has prepared a very special event for us. We are especially delighted and humbled that, as of today, we will be adding two more members to the class of 2020, our two honorary degree recipients, Sister Donna Markham and Reverend David Beckham, whose accomplishments truly serve as illustrations of hope and purpose for us all as we navigate our world. In addition, we are particularly excited that our classmate, Carrie Shortell, will be sharing her valedictory remarks. As you know, we are working with an enthusiastic and creative group of classmates to help plan our on-campus event next year. We're looking forward to being together again, not only to honor the many achievements of our four years, but also to celebrate the friendships that we formed on the Hill. As many of you have experienced, these friendships have been pivotal in getting us through the challenges of the past year. And it's these friendships that will last longer and that will define our lives more than these challenges. What we experience together at Holy Cross will always be with us. Once again, thank you for joining us today. This event should run approximately one hour and we encourage you to remain with us through the end of the presentation. Now, we'd like to hand over the program to a member of the Holy Cross community whom you know well, Mary Beth Kearns Barrett, Director of the Office of College Chaplains for the invocation. Creative and loving God, we gather today in gratitude for the class of 2020. We thank you for all those who have supported them on and made this journey possible. The parents and families who worked and sacrificed, supported and believed, loved and delighted. The professors, mentors and friends who have accompanied, challenged and inspired. For the staff whose dedication makes Holy Cross the beautiful and nurturing place that it is. And for the wonderful body of scholars and dreamers whose works and ideas they have read, studied, and practiced. We recall, too, this class's abrupt departure from campus and the year of uncertainty, isolation, suffering, and loss that followed. As we begin to emerge from the pandemic with all the hope that vaccines bring, help us to move forward, attentive to the racism and related injustices that have been laid bare at this time. Renew our commitment to the common good. Strengthen our resolve to do the hard work that lies ahead. Give us wisdom and courage so that we may be signs of hope. Through what we do with our lives, may new visions emerge of a world where truth and justice prevail. We make our prayer in the spirit of your beloved, whose spirit of love draws us ever closer to you. Amen. Good morning. My name is Margaret Frigi and I serve as the Provost and Dean of the College. It is my great privilege to formally welcome you on behalf of the faculty, staff, administration, and students to this academic convocation. Today we have the opportunity to once again recognize the accomplishments of the Holy Cross Class of 2020, who as students achieved much in their time at Holy Cross and as alumni have already begun to have a significant impact on the world. It is an opportunity to hear from one member of the class, Carrie Shortell, the valedictorian, as she reflects on the accomplishments of the class and their hopes for the future. We will also bestow two honorary degrees today. An honorary degree is the highest accolade awarded by a college or university. 
It is given to an individual whose life's work, professional achievement, service to humanity, and example reflect the highest values of the institution. Honorary degrees are given sparingly. They are awarded at the time of commencement or at another very special occasion, and the awardee typically gives a reflective address. Today, we are pleased to recognize the work of and hear remarks from Reverend David Beckman and Sister Donna Markham. Each recipient has lived the mission of Holy Cross, serving the poor and powerless of the world, walking with those on the margins, working for justice, and marshalling resources to address the systemic inequalities that surround us including inequitable access to food, to housing, and to medical care. In recognizing these individuals, we celebrate their accomplishments and express our gratitude and admiration for all they have done. In highlighting their service, commitment, and leadership, we humbly acknowledge the inspiration they offer to us all and express our hopes for who our students might become as they move forward to serve the world. It is now my privilege to introduce the President of the College of the Holy Cross, Reverend Philip Burroughs of the Society of Jesus. Masterful coalition builder, intrepid and successful advocate for the poor and hungry, missionary economist, Reverend David Beckman, you have dedicated your career to reducing hunger and poverty in the United States and around the world. After earning both your Master of Divinity and Master of Science in Economics, you began your career as an economist at the World Bank. Connecting your faith and moral values to the challenge of poverty, you worked on large-scale development projects in East Africa and Latin America and drove innovations to make the bank more effective in reducing poverty. In 1991, you became president at Bread for the World, a nonpartisan Christian advocacy organization that advocates for policy changes to end hunger. You led broad and successful campaigns to strengthen U.S. political commitment to overcome hunger and poverty in the United States and around the world. Activating your grassroots network of members and activists to work in concert with national denominations, networks, and organizations, you developed a track record of winning bipartisan legislation to help ease hunger. During your almost 30-year tenure, Bread for the World grew to a network of 2 million people and 3,000 local churches. As president, you also led Bread for the World Institute, which publishes complementary research and education. The Institute's annual hunger report is an authoritative analysis of hunger trends and a trusted resource for hunger statistics. In 2001, you founded the Alliance to End Hunger, which engages diverse organizations, including Jewish and Muslim groups, universities, hospitals, charities, and corporations in political and public advocacy to end hunger. You have authored multiple books on hunger, poverty, politics, and faith. You have served as trusted counsel as a member of the President's Advisory Council on Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, USAID's Advisory Committee on Voluntary Foreign Aid, the Trade Advisory Committee on Africa of the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, the U.S. Department of State's Religion and Foreign Policy Working Group, and the Executive Committee of the Modernizing Foreign Assistance Network. And you are a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. You are currently coordinator of the Circle of Protection, an advocacy coalition of Christian church bodies and organizations who together have 100 million members. You are also a joint fellow of the University of California Berkeley's Goldman School of Public Policy and the Graduate Theological Union, where you are working in new ways to end hunger and po poverty. You are teaching and producing a weekly blog and webcast that all may know of our great esteem for you and our strong support for your decades of powerful and successful advocacy to address poverty and hunger 
the College of the Holy Cross confers upon you this day the degree Doctor of Public Service honoris causa. I'm really honored to have this opportunity to speak with you on this important day. Very honored to receive an honorary doctorate from Holy Cross. Holy Cross is a wonderful institution, intellectually rigorous, really committed to the search for truth, committed to service. So congratulations to all of you and to your families uh, for your recent graduation. You're coming out of college uh, just as our country, maybe the world, is coming out of COVID. We now have the vaccine. And so over the next years, we're going to be making very big decisions about our future directions as a country and a world. And that's gonna be happening just as you make big decisions about your individual future. I come to this time with a lot of encouragement from the world's unprecedented progress against hunger and poverty over the last few decades. I've focused most of my work life on overcoming hunger and poverty and um, have been just delighted to watch as uh, the world has made unprecedented progress. My first job was in Northwest Bangladesh. I, uh, I spent a lot of time in a little settlement called Gorea, about a hundred houses. And uh, when I'd stay overnight in Gorea, I lived with the primary school teacher, Mr. Bari. I would sleep in his house. Uh, I got to know Mr. Bari and his neighbors because when the sun went down, the lights went out. <laughs> so we'd sit around in the dark and uh, talk. My Bengali got good enough by that point that I could participate. I was able to go back decades later to Bangladesh and even to Korea. I was just delighted to see how much progress they've made. It's still a very poor country, but the roads were better, the schools were better, the women were more assertive, the, the kids were, more, were clearly better nourished. Um, I, I was able to find Mr. Body. We had a wonderful reunion. Um, his house, which used to be thatched, is now a concrete house. He took me out back. There's a place where there was a gully uh, where mosquitoes used to breed. That gully's been filled in. He thanks God, Allah, um, that his life has turned out much better than he expected. And in fact, there are people in many parts of the developing world who can tell similar stories. In the year 2000, around about the time that many of you were born, uh, there were one and a half billion people in the world in absolute hungry poverty. That dramatically declined during COVID, it's, it's gone up. But even now, the World Bank thinks there are about 750 million people in absolute poverty. That's a tragedy but it's half as many people in that kind of horrible poverty as, as in the year 2000. Uh, during most of that period, I've been involved in leading legislative advocacy across the country. And so I've seen that ordinary people who focus on an issue, do their homework and then work in a smart way to try to influence their members of Congress can do it. And um, when they work with people, like-minded people across the country, uh, just committed people can make big changes in the policies of the most powerful government in the world. At this point, President Biden is urging us as we build back from COVID, to build back better. I think he's right. We shouldn't satis be satisfied with going back to who we were. I think he's right that we should deal as we strengthen the economy, we should also make it a, a good economy for everybody, low income people, people of color, and that we should reduce our, uh, our carbon emissions during this process. 
Now, you know, people can disagree. You know, there are lots of things to disagree about. People of goodwill can disagree about the balance among those objectives and other objectives. They can disagree about the ambition of the president's plans. They can dis certainly disagree about the specific policies and programs. Uh, you've been practicing for four years having collective discussion about big issues like that. And the discussion will continue. I, I hope big decisions are made this year, but in any case, we're gonna be deciding over the next period of years about what kind of nation, what kind of world we will be. And these are the years in which you will also uh, be making big decisions at your time of life. You have extraordinary freedom and flexibility. Uh, you know, you can set out in one direction and 20 years later decide, whoops, that was wrong and go another direction. But as we get older, it becomes more and more difficult to strike out in bold directions. And we need you to strike out in bold directions, to plan for your economic security, sure, but also to plan lives of meaning and purpose. We really need you to carve out part of your life, part of your energy to be an active citizen. And we need you to think boldly, think big on behalf of the world. So again, uh, congratulations. We have very high hopes for you. Trailblazing leader, faith-filled advocate for the poor and vulnerable, passionate protector of migrant and refugee children and families. Sister Donna Markham, from improving treatment programs for those living with mental illnesses to directing the largest social safety net provider in the United States, to advocating on Capitol Hill for policies that uphold dignity for all people. You have made it your life's work to serve those who have been forgotten, marginalized, or denigrated. You began your career as a clinical psychologist, earning your doctorate from the University of Detroit and being named a fellow in the American Association of Clinical Psychologists. You served as the founding director of the Dominican Consultation Center in Detroit and you were the first woman to teach courses at St. John's Provincial Seminary in Plymouth, Michigan. After serving on the general counsel of the Adrian Dominican Congregation, you were invited to become the first woman executive director of the Southdown Institute, a residential treatment program based in Ontario, Canada, for priests and women and men religious dealing with addictions or other psychological issues. You were called from this position to become the prioress of the Adrian Dominican Congregation in 2004. In 2010, you became the president of the Behavioral Health Institute for Mercy Health. Here, you were charged with transforming the delivery of behavioral health services across the system's 24 hospitals in Ohio and Kentucky. Drawing on your skills in organizational change management, a topic on which you are a published expert. You redesigned the physical spaces to provide the optimal environment for care for mental health services and ensured that the system's programs provided a continuum of care by a collaborative and connected network of physicians and specialists. You served for eight years on the Board of Trustees, two as Board Chair of Catholic Charities USA, the National Office for Catholic Charities Agencies Nationwide. In 2012, you were asked to become the first woman president in the organization's 110-year history, leading Catholic Charities USA's members to provide help and create hope for more than 13 million people a year, regardless of religious, social, or economic backgrounds. As president, you developed a strategic vision for the organization by turning to the parable of the Good Samaritan, asking, who today is lying by the side of the road in need of help? Your answers drove the organization's focus on areas such as affordable housing, integrated health and nutrition, immigration and refugee services, and disaster services. You continue to speak out on the humanitarian crisis at the border 
and to advocate for compassionate treatment of refugees and their families. You are engaged in global peace initiatives directed toward building bridges of understanding and collaboration across conflict zones. You serve as a consultant to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops in the areas of migration, domestic policy, and racism. And that all may know of our great esteem for you and our strong support for your skilled and committed leadership in serving our most vulnerable, suffering, or forgotten. The College of the Holy Cross confers upon you this day the degree Doctor of Social Science Honoris Causa. Father Burroughs, members of the Board of Trustees, alums, graduates, and all of you who make up this wonderful community of the College of the Holy Cross, thank you so very much for this incredible honor. I'm truly deeply humbled. My dad was an alum of Holy Cross, and I grew up hearing absolutely wonderful stories of his time at this college. More significantly, I'm also quite certain that his immersion in Jesuit spirituality had a lot to do with my becoming a Dominican sister. Today, I'd like to share a few brief thoughts with you about the importance of radical hospitality, as I believe it is central to addressing the realities we're contending with during these extremely stressful and contentious times that seem to be getting more and more every day. Some of you may recall one of the more memorable lines uttered by Walt Kelly's old comics, comic strip possum, uh, Pogo, an inhabitant of the mythical Okefenokee Swamp. When Pogo uttered, we have met the enemy and the enemy is us. In so many ways, it seems that we human beings have gotten ourselves into a terribly dangerous state of affairs in which we've pitted ourselves against one another to such an extent that we're gambling with the very future of our democracy, the future of our planet, and our own futures and those of our loved ones. This is our very own Okefenokee Swamp, suffering from a pandemic filled with racial inequity and rife with political viciousness. I believe you and I, followers of Jesus who strive to live gospel-driven lives, and you who were fortunate to have had the gift of an education permeated with Ignatian spirituality, you and I are called to be the ones to bring reconciliation and civility into this swamp of ours. Welcoming, listening, mediating, and respectfully challenging. This is our time to offer hospitality in very inhospitable places. Pogo inhabits the swamp along with many other characters who are fraught with the whole range of human vices, but he's the one who's the mediating character, at times naive, but also wise and compassionate. Pogo is the one who cares about everyone, called by fellow swamp dweller Albert the Alligator, a two-minute egghead, a bleeding heart. And even though we might be accused of naivete sometimes, I am inviting you to join me in being followers of Jesus and perhaps pogo sur surrogates, extending radical hospitality to a panoply of roughed up, suffering, dispossessed, misunderstood, or outcast people who cross paths with us. Caring for those who are homeless, who are hungry, who are asylum seekers and refugees, who are black or brown or Asian or LGBTQ sisters and brothers or members of a different political party or a different faith. This is time for us to bring reconciliation, understanding and hospitality to this swamp of ours. Another inhabitant of Okefenokee is Porcupine who asserts, you know, it's the inherent right of all to make darn fools of themselves. We are all too aware that these days we may have done that too through participation in microaggressions, judgmentalism, disregard for those who are different from ourselves. 
It's time for all of us to stop being darn fools and transform our swamp into a place where all are welcomed and respected. In my very bones, I believe this is our time as believers, as women and men of faith, to advocate and witness to a more peaceable kingdom where all are welcomed. How are we gonna do this? The fundamental entry point for establishing a more hospitable world is the capacity to engage in dialogue. This is the vaccine against violence of all kinds. It's the foundation for community building and the means toward which we approach the common good. It's the core of relationship building. We connect with others through dialogue and through dialogue, we extend hospitality and inclusion. The significance of this dialogical connection has become a field of study for many people concerned with the precarious state of existence that we're in these days. One of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century and a prominent physicist, David Bohm, wrote in his book on dialogue, love will go away if we can't communicate and share meaning. If we really can't, if we really communicate, he says, then we will have participation, friendship, and love. Such energy, he says, has been called communion. While David Bohm couldn't have imagined the danger of these times, he knew at some profound level how essential it is for us to foster welcoming community as the antidote to violence. Love will go away if we can't communicate. So, as followers of Jesus, and maybe Pogo buddies, let's encourage each other to inject love, hospitality, and justice into this suffering world. Again, I thank you so very much for this great honor. I now have the privilege of introducing Carrie Shortell, valedictorian of the class of 2020. Carrie is a native of Pearl River, New York, and graduated from Holy Cross as a sociology and psychology major with a concentration in gender, sexuality, and women's studies. She is a member of the Alpha Kappa Delta International Sociology Honor Society, Alpha Sigma Nu, the Jesuit Honor Society, and Phi Beta Kappa. While at Holy Cross, Carrie wrote a sociology honors thesis on domestic violence and undertook archival work for the Worcester Women's History Project. Carrie also was active in co-curricular activities and served as co-chair of the Holy Cross Dance Marathon to raise funds for pediatric HIV AIDS, a student leader for multiple retreats, and a leader for a spring break immersion trip to Glasgow, Virginia. Further, she was an orientation leader for Fall Gateways and a resident assistant in Brooks Hall. Carrie spent her junior year abroad at the University College Cork, Ireland. Currently, Carrie serves in the Jesuit Volunteer Corps as an assistant campus minister at Cristo Rey Jesuit High School in San Jose, California. Welcome, Carrie. President Burroughs, incoming President Rougeau, Provost Frigi, Dean Anderson, members of the Board of Trustees, Sister Donna Markham, Reverend David Beckman, faculty and staff, fellow members of the class of 2020, and all of those who have supported us during our time at Holy Cross and beyond. Welcome. After a trying year, I am so excited to share this honor with all of you as we celebrate this milestone honorary degree convocation, as well as the one year anniversary of our very own degree conferral, at long last. I was on the Spiritual Exercises Silent Retreat when I first learned of the tragic accident involving the Holy Cross women's rowing team in January of 2020. It was Father Mack who tearfully broke the news to us, a group comprised mainly of seniors standing on the brink of everything the shining promises of our final semester together on Mount St. James, the dreaded job hunt, and the infinite possibilities of life beyond the cross. 
Shocked as we all were in that terrible moment, I could not help but feel amazed that even in the silence, our broken hearts beat as one. There was a wholeness to it all, a feeling of being a part of something tremendous. Over the next few days, I did what any Holy Cross student does when tasked with nothing more than to remain silent. I read. I desperately sought answers, despite knowing there were none to be had. Even when news reached us of the immense response, both within and beyond our community, I was unrelenting in my search for meaning. Eventually, my labors bore fruit in the form of a single phrase that captured my imagination. There is always hope at the cross. There is always hope at the cross. Now, the Christian meaning of this statement is quite apparent. In times of sorrow, grief, and uncertainty, healing and promise can be found within God's loving embrace. This statement comforted me. But my interest was piqued for another equally compelling reason. Amidst the all-embracing love pouring out in the wake of this tragedy, I could not help but think about my experiences of hope at Holy Cross, the cross with a capital C as we so lovingly refer to it. Sure, we are a deeply imperfect community within a deeply imperfect world, but even and especially in those imperfections, there is room for hope. Hope is in the walls of every building here at Holy Cross. It flows through every brick in every ivy-colored wall of every academic building, every residence hall, every inch of this place we call home. Hope lives in Fenwick, where prospective students anxiously await tours and wonder if this campus can truly be this beautiful year round. Yes, it can. Hope lives in Hogan, where student leaders of groups ranging from DESI to Eco Action to Feminist Forum have made their causes the center of their storm and share this passion with our community. Hope lives in Stein, in O'Neill, in Smith and Bevan and so on, where we built individual connections with our professors and flaws where we encountered others who share in our dedication to learning, where time and again we were awakened from what theologian Thomas Merton termed the dream of separateness, coming to terms with the responsibility accompanying the fact that each of our lives is inextricably intertwined. Hope lives in Campion, where all are welcome regardless of creed or identity. Welcome for a cookie and welcome to stay a while. Hope lives in Brooks Residence Hall, where the first class of Holy Cross women resided, taking the first tentative steps into the brave new world of co-ed learning. Irrespective of gender, each of us stands on the shoulders of these women. Hope lives in the Luth Center, where student athletes participate in a vibrant community united by their tenacity to represent our college and to represent it well, where athletes, families, and alumni come together in support of the cross. Hope lives in the foundation of the Performing Arts Center and the newly completed Joe which remind us of the humbling and exciting promise that just as we will evolve and grow after Holy Cross, Holy Cross will evolve and grow after us, each of us inching towards a future that has yet to be seen. Hope lives in Dinand, where I parked myself for hours on end two summers ago studying domestic violence as my fellow scholars researched addiction immigration, and other pressing issues, striving to expand our minds so that we might one day build the more just and hopeful world we have heard so much about. 
Hope lives in the Worcester community, where students participated in after-school tutoring programs, staffed the Abbey's House thrift shop, acted as big brothers and sisters to local students, and in doing so, explored basic human questions surrounding dignity and solidarity. Hope lives in St. Joseph's Chapel, where we were enveloped in the boundless love of God, and in that way, we were renewed. So yes, there is always hope at the cross, I determined, excited to commence my final semester on the hill. You all know how this story goes. Not two months had elapsed before we were packing up our things and saying the goodbyes for which we were meant to have months to prepare. We mourned the loss of what was supposed to be the best semester of college, the culmination of years of hard work and dedicated study. No more working for Worcester, no more Tuesday pub nights, no more spring weekend. Before long, the only hope we could cling to was the hope for some kind of gathering, for a chance to give a proper farewell to the people and the place that had made us. Even that hung in the balance as the pandemic continued to grow more dire. The story of the class of 2020 is unlike any other. While other classes may have experienced hope alive in the place that is Holy Cross, we were forced to recognize hope alive in the people. After all, what is Holy Cross if not a community of individuals united by their desire to learn and to grow as one? No longer able to delight in the physical place that is Holy Cross, we began to delight in one another and in the hope of a reunion, becoming what the Jesuits would call a communitas ad dispersionem, a community dispersed but united nonetheless. Before long, we began to experience that same wholeness we felt after we lost Grace Rett, as well as a sense of pride for being a part of a community that resisted any and all forces that could have fractured it. This past year has been one of enduring, extraordinary suffering. There is no denying that. Some of us are weary of mourning family members and loved ones, weary of navigating the job market in an economy battered by the pandemic, or simply weary of having to choose hope over and over despite the isolation, anxiety, and uncertainty we face. And maybe some of us are doing absolutely fine, seamlessly beginning our careers or moving on to further education and opportunities. Regardless of where each of us stands, the fact remains that willingly or not, we have been marked as part of Holy Cross's legacy of enduring hope, an incredible and transformative hope that has carried and will continue to carry us forward See, where there are cracks in our hope, there is room for all things good to trickle in. If we did not ever feel hopeless, there would be no potential, no opportunity. This experience has made us stronger, braver, more prepared to do the courageous work of going forth and setting the world on fire. Although, I might add that our world has had enough fire and chaos to last us a lifetime. Still, this story is not defined by its closing chapter. There will come a time when we will gather to celebrate our accomplishments together, emphasis on the together, before we once more disperse across the country and world, carrying all that we have cultivated along with us. I would implore you to take what you have learned at Holy Cross to build a more just and hopeful world. But really, that's what we've been doing all along. Instead, I extend an invitation to continued hope, a hope I define as the gift of seeking wholeness where it is, and an invitation to action, 
to address the injustice and suffering woven into the fabric of our world. Our world may be deeply imperfect, but we must continue to draw the hope we need to change it from the cross, from what we have learned here, from who we have become and are still becoming. Hope is in the walls of Holy Cross and so too is in each of us. More than ever before, I believe that there is always home, there is always love, there is always hope at the cross. I look forward to seeing that hope alive in you as I always have when we come together to celebrate the class of 2020 as we always dreamed we would. Thank you. Oh, hear thy voice as one in song. Holy cross, oh, holy cross, thy spirit's Lord.